Today's presenter is Catherine Marciano. Catherine is a licensed clinical social worker. She began her career in 1981 and joined Washington Hospital as a social worker in 2006. Good evening. It's nice to see you all. Um, I am here to uh, basically help you, as I assume most of you are caregivers. Is that accurate? How many of you are currently caregivers? For Okay, some of you are. Okay. Um, well, I would like to help you to find ways to navigate the health care system, both within the hospital and as an outpatient at home, so that you can remain, or the patient that you are caring for, can remain in home uh, with as many services as possible for as long as possible. Fortunately, we live in a wonderful area that has many services available. The first thing that I could recommend uh, to you is to have a post, and I, I'm passing around a, a post form, which is a, a physician orders for life-sustaining treatment, P-O-L-S-T. Um, the other is a sample copy of an advanced health care directive. Um, they're portable. They can, they, you can bring them to the hospital with you or to your doctor's office with you. Uh, you can bring them to another state. You can, um, anywhere in this country, you can bring them to another state and they will be um, honored. Uh, the post is filled out uh, in conjunction with your physician. It is signed by your physician. And b both of these documents are legally binding uh, only as long as you decide that you want this to be current. You can rip up a post and make a new post um, every month if you wanted to. And the same thing goes with the Advanced Health Care Directive. Uh, if you have witnesses for your advanced health care directive, you do not need to have it notarized. If you don't have witnesses, hospital employees or uh, doctor's employees are not able to witness that uh, advanced health care directive form for, due to a conflict of interest, so you would need to have a notary uh, do that for you. Um, and then in that case, if you need a notary, you need to have two forms of identification uh, with you, a driver's license and another form of identification. Um, the wonderful part about having a post or an advanced health care directive is that it is uh, a message. Uh, the purpose of it is, of course, to communicate to your uh, medical team if you are unable to communicate your own wishes. You have already, in advance, the advanced health care directive directed the health care team to what interventions you would like and you would not like done. For example, would I like CPR if my heart stops, or would I like to be intubated? Do I want a tube down my throat if I can't breathe for myself for a while? Do I want a feeding tube if I'm not able to take nutrition uh, independently or orally? Those are some of the kinds of questions uh, that are covered in the Pulse and the Advanced Health Care Directive. And certainly, as Dr. Parmley was saying, these are some of the questions that you would ask in a doctor's visit. You would, you would discuss these things with your doctor in advance and make sure that you understand what these terms really mean. Um, and then, then you can write this down on your form. Uh, the, on these forms, you have an agent on the Advanced Health Care Directive form. Uh, you can have one or two agents. And um, some people choose family members. Some people choose friends. It really is up to you. Um, and that person really, the role of that person is to carry out your wishes and to communicate that, those wishes to the health care team, either in the hospital or with your doctor uh, as an outpatient. Um, if you ever have to call 911 for yourself or for uh, a patient that you're caring for, and I, I'm sort of directing this as caregiver navigation tips, um, it's recommended that you keep a copy of the Advanced Health Care Directive or POLST in your possession. Uh, a lot of people like to put it on the refrigerator uh, at home or even in the freezer, I have heard a number of times, because that somehow the ambulance people know to look in the freezer for, in a plastic bag for these kinds of important documents. So, um, And then uh, the, the doctor's office should have a copy of your uh, documents, and so should the hospital. If you are admitted, uh, what happens if you come to Washington Hospital is that we scan those documents so it's in our computer system, the EPIC system that Dr. Parmley was just talking about, and then um, unless there's a change to it, you don't need to bring it in every time you come in. Um, the other thing that I would recommend, uh, just in terms of an outpatient caregiving mode, um, or is and also once a patient is admitted to the hospital, is to identify one person as the primary spokesperson for the family. Um, 
Sometimes, you know, we have large families and, and people have different work shifts and everyone loves and cares for the patient involved and um, so wants to be involved and active in the, in the care planning and, and understanding of the treatment care plan. Um, but it, it really is most efficient of healthcare uh, to sort of have a family care conference, for example, either at the doctor's office or here in the hospital and have assign your qu uh, questions to one person to ask and um, distribute the information either by telephone or you know, in communication by email with other people. Um, in, with the effort of uh, involved sometimes in trying to maintain a patient who needs caregiving at home, um, it's good to know that there are several options available to you on several, several different levels of care. The most skilled need of care for patients is, is home health care, and skilled needs refer to what are covered by insurance. Medicare uh, and private insurances will cover a skilled nurse, a physical therapy, occupational therapy, and a, a master of social work um, person to come to your home. Uh, that kind of skilled care needs to be ordered by a physician in order to be approved by your insurance. Some insurances will require prior authorization and either the doctor staff as an outpatient uh, can take care of that or the case manager within a hospital setting would take care of that on the inside of the hospital um, to get authorization for that um, treatment. But that's called skilled uh, home care. There, in one of the books that I'm I asked um, uh, you all to pass around to one another, it's called a lifestyle booklet and it has all the different home care agencies that are available in this, in this uh, tri-city area for people to choose from. Um, some health care insurances prefer certain insurance, uh, certain agencies over others. They have contracts with them, but generally most home uh, health care agencies are available to anyone. The tricky part about the home health care agency is that the services continue um, as long as the patient is progressing. So say I am at home, um, I've been released from the hospital, I'm at home, I have fallen and I've been in bedridden for a week or two and I'm deconditioned or even a month or so and I'm deconditioned so that I need strengthening. I don't, I'm, I'm able to walk and ambulate but I'm unsteady and I'm weak and I just really need that daily kind of strengthening. Um, so my doctor orders physical therapy for me. So as long as I am progressing at home when the physical therapist comes to see me and so today I'm walking 10 feet, the next day I'm walking 30 feet, uh, insurances will continue to authorize the visits. But if I plateau, is what they call it, at 30 feet and after a week or so I'm just not getting better, then those services are, are discontinued for that time um, because it's not an ongoing maintenance, it's just, a, it's just to get you back to your best baseline. Um, the next level of care, uh, also if you're at home and you, and, uh, or if the patient is at home and you go to Dr. Parmley's office, for example, or your physician, and it's indicated that, you, that the doctor thinks that you might need a home health care visit, um, he can order that from his home office. He just calls the home care agency or writes an order directly to that home care agency. And all that happens is that your basic history and physical and basic plan of care and treatment plan is faxed with your permission to that home health care agency. Then the home health care agency representative, the nurse uh, or, or intake coordinator, will call you, the patient, or you, the caregiver, and set up the first time of an appointment. Caregiving can ha uh, when you're discharged from a hospital, um, generally speaking, it's not uh, covered until the next day, unless you're going home uh, on hospice or with infusion, you know, an IV at home, and then it has to be the same day visit. Um, the next level of care for people who um, need care at home or who are caregiving for people at home would be attendant care services. And this is kind of tricky as well because a lot of people who have long-term care insurance plans are under the assumption that these, this kind of care, attendant care, which normally is paid for privately by individuals, is covered by their long-term care insurance. I would strongly recommend to you that you review any policies if you do have a long-term care uh, policy because they are uh, widely different in what they do and don't cover. Some policies will cover the very end stage of life but not before um, and other policies do provide a much more extensive uh, attendant care. So a review policy with your uh, agent. Attendant care um, addresses issues like bathing, dressing, uh, meal preparation, transportation to and from a medical appointment, lighthouse work, changing bed linens, for example, or doing um, uh, laundry. 
Uh, and some agencies in the area, again, that's in the Lifestyles book. It's really a very complete book, and we can provide you with a copy of that um, if you come into the hospital at some point or call after. I'd be happy to mail you out any resources. I'll give you my contact information at the end, and any community resources that you need, I would be happy to um, help you find. Um, but uh, attendant care is, there are a number of different agencies. Most of them have four-hour minimum requirements um, for their staff person to come out to the home. Uh, they're licensed and bonded. Um, some agencies do not have the four-hour minimum. Say if you, really, if you really don't need four hours a day, if you just need someone to help you get uh, up and bathed and dressed and start your day, and then you have other people who are coming in or family members to stay with you later in the day. Or if you need someone to help you tuck you into bed at night and, and you know, uh, uh, give you dinner. Um, so uh, there are some agencies that, that don't have a minimum, and uh, they're not as many, but there are a good four or five agencies in this area that are excellent that, that will not ask you to have a minimum. The range of cost for attendant care is kind of surprising. It's expensive. It's about $17 an hour at the least, to up to $30 an hour, um, and they do, um, they do expect payment in full, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's difficult for people. If a patient has Medi-Cal um, as opposed to Medicare, or, or in addition to Medicare, um, Medi-Cal has a program called In-Home Supportive Services, IHSS for short. It's a great program. Currently, it has a one to three month waiting list to process the application. Uh, we do that here at the hospital. If you're an inpatient here, it can be done from your doctor's office. You can go on to alameda.gov.com and uh, download the two-page IHSS application form. It's very simple, very basic. Um, it just has a page for the patient's information and a page for the physician's information. So you would bring that second page to your physician for him or her to complete. Um, and it basically is just saying what your needs are, what your, what your limitations are, and why you think that you need help. Your doctor would confirm that and justify that, give a diagnosis. and. Um, what happens then is that's sent into the uh, Department of Social Services of Alameda County, for example, in our county, and uh, assigned a case manager who would then contact the patient or the caregiver, arrange a home visit uh, to assess, and then that ca a case manager assigns the number of hours on a monthly basis that the caregiving will be authorized for. You have two choices for caregiving. You can find someone in your family or your neighborhood or your, within your support network who can serve as your care provider through IHSS, and IHSS will pay them. They'll be the designated payee. Or you can go through the provider list that's provided through in-home supportive services. Um, either, either of those is an option. Okay. Um, it didn't used to take such a long time to have it uh, approved, but because of furlough days and, you know, with the cutbacks in the county system, it is taking a while longer. Um, the wonderful thing about Fremont is that the Senior Support Services Program has some excellent programs available to seniors uh, in the area, uh, pe people 60 and above. Um, and they're available to residents of Fremont, Newark, and Union City. Some of the services, and you can go online again to senior support services of, of the city of Fremont, um, but some of them that are really especially wonderful for people who are um, coping at home with a decline in health or a bump in the road in their health are these. There's a senior peer counseling program where a trained counselor will come to your house um, or you can go to the office at the city of Fremont Senior Services Center if you're not having, uh, comfortable having someone come to your home. So you have the choice. But these uh, counselors will provide emotional support for patients who are undergoing you know, transitions in their health status. Um, the counselors are supervised by a licensed mental health clinician at the city of Fremont. Then there's a mobile mental health program for people who are experiencing anxiety or depression or experiencing issues of grief and loss that might be exacerbated by their own current issues of loss of health or a change in health status. These clinicians will come to your home, and they will uh, work with you to provide counseling uh, to, to help you make that passage through the grief and, and uh, loss issues, or refer you to a psychiatrist for um, medication management if it's determined that uh, you are in need of some, or you would benefit from some medication for anxiety or depression. So uh, that's really a wonderful program to have. 
The City of Fremont Health Promotion Program is a program for fa uh, frail Afghan uh, members of our community who are elders, and um, it, will, it will do the same thing. It comes to the home and sort of arranges, takes, takes a view of what's needed, what community resources are needed to help this person remain in the home. Um, and then one of the last things that, I, that probably most people know about, because you see the, the buses and the vans everywhere, is paratransit. And that's in Newark, Union City, Hayward, Fremont. And paratransit is uh, a wonderful program where you, uh, can, you can apply if you are having difficulty getting yourself independently to a doctor's appointment or to chemotherapy appointments, for example, to our infusion center or to radiation therapy or to outpatient physical therapy. Um, and if you're not able to take the bus or use public transportation safely, um, or if there simply is no one in your family uh, who can do this for you, you can uh, enroll. You can re uh, enroll in paratransit. Your application is reviewed. There is a, a, a cost, but it's usually based on um, income and eligibility. The form for paratransit is about an eight-page form, but it's very straightforward. It's not. It sounds intimidating, but it's not. It's just about a series of 20 questions about what your physical limitations are, when your diagnosis uh, was established, how, what limitations do you notice. For example, could you stand at a bus station for 15 minutes alone waiting for a bus? Would that be safe? Um, do you use an assistive device to help you uh, walk? Do you use a walker, wheelchair, cane? Can you sit up in a, in a van to get to your uh, dialysis appointment, for example? Are you able to sit up? Um, you do need to be able to sit up to be able to use paratransit. Pa patients who need to recline are not uh, appropriate for a paratransit application. The other thing that I think is really, really important as a social worker, I've been doing this what seems like forever now, and I think that um, I'm so grateful that I've had the experiences I've had working with patients and families because it really gives one a perspective on um, what we all need to do to plan or, or what, how we all should uh, work as advocates for those we love and for ourselves. And one of the things that it's hard to face sometimes, but as we see health declining in a loved one or in our own families our, ourselves, is to begin to plan for alternative housing options sooner rather than later. So for example, if mom is at home, but mom is failing and, and um, it doesn't look like she's going to be able to manage independently, even with the kind of care provision that we've just been describing and talking about, um, it's a good idea to start visiting assisted living facilities in the area. Again, that's also all listed in the Lifestyles booklet that's going around. Um, to, to visit ward and care agencies uh, or, or homes to see um, what might be available, what's affordable. This is not covered by private insurance. Assisted living or um, ward and cares are not covered by private insurance. Um, if you're conserved by the state, that's taken care of. The board and care is taken care of, but uh, not otherwise. Um, it's expensive. Um, it's good to plan in advance for it. Um, and it's good to get your name or your patient's name, if, if you're not the patient, uh, on the waiting list of these places. You can always decline if they call you in six months or a year and say, you know, this spot is available. Are you still interested? Um, but it's a good idea to have your loved one on the waiting list. The other question that I would recommend that um, be addressed is uh, thinking in advance for uh, burial arrangements or wishes for burial. There are lots of different options um, available, and it's wise to make these arrangements as difficult as it might be to talk about. Um, it's really wise to talk about it if, if you can with your loved one or within your family system and with your doctor because uh, it's it's wiser to make these decisions when you're not under the stress of the immediate moment. It's also financially much wiser. There are different mortuaries, and again, I would be happy to talk with you about this in you know, private if you have questions about that, but there are different mortuaries in the area who will discount. And um, if you know a, a young child, for example, who's very ill, there are different mortuaries who will not charge anything for a young child who's dying. Um, uh, there are different cremation societies that are available, and there are some in Northern California that are very cost effective and others that are not. So uh, there are options, and it's good to explore that. That's also something that sort of, if you think about it, goes hand in hand as you're filling out your advanced health care directive. You know, these are the kinds of issues. When that time comes, we're all mortal. We all are going to have to face those decisions. So when that time comes, what do I think I might like? Would I like to participate in my 
funeral arrangements. Would I like to contribute something to my funeral service? Is there a special something I would like to say or have read for me uh, that I want to communicate to my loved ones after I've gone? So those kinds of things, you know, you'd be surprised once you start to have the conversation, it gets easier and you start to think about it. And um, so again, I would be happy to speak with anyone at any time if you want more information about that. Um, the other issue related to that is if you're interested in organ donation, the California Donor Network, is uh, that's something that you can also address in the Advanced Healthcare Directive. There is a section in that Advanced Healthcare Directive that asks if you would like to participate in the organ donation program. You can always change your mind, even at the last minute. So, um, but if you'd like to, that would be a time to do that as well. I was asked to speak about, uh, in particular, a navigation tip about what to do in the middle of the night if you're a caregiver of someone at home. So what to do in the middle of the night if you're a caregiver with a patient who is homebound and you are, you are in the home with that patient and you're concerned that the patient, uh, say for example, needs to get up to use the bathroom and slides out of bed and you cannot get the patient up off the floor, or the patient seems faint or is complaining of heart palpitations or any, anything, just maybe not feeling himself. It could be a whole variety of things. If the patient is followed by a home health care agency, home health care agencies have 24-hour on-call nurses who are advice nurses, sort of like Kaiser does. You know, I have an advice nurse any time. You can call after hours and have your phone call picked up by the advice nurse. If you are being followed by a hospice agency, and remember hospice is a, a, play, a theory of care, it's the kind of care, it's not a place of care. So if you're being followed by a hospice agency at home, they also have a designated nurse on call 24-7 who can be at your home within one to two hours, in addition to taking your call and working through the issues of concern that you've noticed with yourself or the, or the patient involved. If you are not the caregiver who's in the home with the patient, but you're concerned, hmm, I called mom at seven o'clock, our usual time for me to call her, and she didn't pick up, and neighbors aren't around, or neighbors aren't available to check in, and you call again at eight o'clock or nine o'clock, and mom is still not answering, that's not like her, and you cannot, get to her for some reason, there is um, a, something that the police departments in the community will do. It's called a wellness check. And you can call Fremont Police Department. I've done it many times for many of our patients. Um, and they will go to the home to make sure that mom is okay. And if they cannot get in, but they, they might hear mom calling out or they might see a foot in the hallway or wonder if mom has fallen trying to get out of the bathroom or they are legally able to enter the home to make sure that she's safe. So that's called a wellness check. The police department is happy to do it, um, and um, I highly recommend that as something. Then, of course, you probably all know about the medical alert systems that are available in the community. There are a number of them. Life Alert is one of them, but there are lots of different ones, and some of them are highly sophisticated. They're attached to computers, and the, some of them have computers that you could have uh, televised into your own computer if you're not the caregiver in the home. So. Uh, there's a range of them, and, and we could certainly talk with you. You could call our social work department any time during the week and ask to speak with the social worker uh, about what those options would be. There's a fee for those that's not covered by insurance. They generally start out at about $25 to $30 a month, maybe a little bit more, but it's worth it if you are not um, re readily able to uh, geographically get access to your, your loved one. Okay. In the hospital here and in the community, we have what are called nurse navigation teams, and that's another handout that I passed out. We have five nurse navigators. So if, for example, mom comes into the hospital or mom is going for um, oncology uh, infusion, having chemotherapy therapy treatment say, at our infusion center or somewhere else, and um, the family and mom need support services. Uh, they need maybe a nutritional consult because it's difficult to swallow or there's some mouth sores or things like that. The nurse navigator will make all those referrals for you. The x-ray uh, radiation therapy department has the same, has another nurse navigator uh, for that department. And then there are three general nurse navigators within the hospital system here who are available to you. 
So for example, you know, once you come into the hospital, we have our whole team of multidisciplinary care professionals who discuss every patient's case in rounds and try to take care of all those needs. But you know, when you're an outpatient or you're just going to an office visit or this appointment or that appointment, there isn't this you know, sort of collective understanding of what your needs are. That's the purpose of the nurse navigator, to help, you fig help figure out what you need and how to get you there. And that's always available to you free of charge. Okay, so I think that's pretty much what I had to say. I hope I, I, hope I got heard. I hope I wasn't uh, too quiet here.